My name is Stephanie Watts. I am a professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology at Michigan State University. And sitting next to me is the Excellence and Hypertension Research Awardee for 2023, Dr. Lisa Cassis from the University of Kentucky. I had the pleasure of getting to nominate this wonderful woman for this award, which is long overdue. So I get to sit here and talk and ask her about, the first thing I have to ask you is, how did you feel when you got this award? Well, I think I mostly felt thankful to you, Stephanie. <laughs> so Stephanie, um, in addition to being an, uh, you're, you're just an incredible scientist, but you are such an advocate for cardiovascular researchers, and you were an advocate for me. And you went out of your way to nominate me and, and put together a nominating dream team, in yes. essence, and they were, yes. including you. And um, it's just amazing. To, to receive this honor. When I look at the people who have received it yes. previously, I can't even believe that I am now added to that list. Oh, uh, but see, I know that you should be there. So, so this award is considered the Nobel Prize of Hypertension Research, uh, and you and I have both been attending this meeting, oh goodness, for over 30 years yeah. for me. And we know how important this is to recognize someone who has moved ideas forward and then given birth to other different fields. Uh, so you are so accomplished in what you've done, Lisa, and I, I know I'll talk about the different things that you've done, but how did this start for you in terms of loving science and then being unafraid to do things that other people hadn't done? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I am from, um, I'm from West Virginia and my parents didn't go to college and uh, they made sure that all of their children went to college. And uh, when I decided to go to graduate school, my mother was just actually horrified. And she said, <laughs> she was what horrified. are you doing? I have one daughter and she's going to work with rats and mice and things like that. Um, but I, for some reason, when I got into a lab, just like we entice people into our programs, right? Yep. We, we yep, bring yep, them yep, in. Yep. And I just, I loved the thought process. I loved understanding and I think most importantly I love discovering. Yes. And maybe it's because sometimes I get bored that I move on, I start something and I find something and then I move on to something very different and it always makes it exciting and a new question and um, a new direction. So hypertension, you know, was my PhD. Okay. I was in hypertension. My my both that of was my also West Virginia, yeah, right? and both of my postdoctoral fellowships were in the hypertension area. And uh, really, this meeting was the first time I really ever presented on the renin angiotensin system, in in the context of hypertension. And so this meeting means a lot in the AHA. A hypertension Council means a lot to me. So how did you get to the discovery of, which is one of the reasons you're getting this award, of angiotensinogen in adipocytes? So people would say apple, orange, uh -huh. how did those two go together? Well, you know, it's really, I shouldn't say this because I, I have this award, but pretty much every, <laughs> every finding that I've had the, whatever it might be, significant great fortune to have made um, were almost accidents. Yeah. So, so what I always say to yeah. trainees is don't put the blinders on. Yes. Don't put the blinders on. Um, and that was an accidental finding. That was a finding that where I couldn't explain uh, something uh, meaning angiotensinogen in blood vessels. It, I, I, I saw it there, but I couldn't find where in the vessel wall. And then one day I simply looked at the vessel and said, hmm. I'm cleaning all this stuff off the vessel to process it. I wonder if it has angiotensinogen. So I probed it for angiotensinogen, and lo and behold, it did. Uh, and then I, I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. I did not. Yeah. I did not know what peri, you know, peri or perivascular fat. I had yeah. never, I just cleaned it, like all the organ bath physiologists did when we were doing our studies. Yes. We clean this stuff off. And um, I looked in every fat depot in the, in the rat, and, and they all expressed angiotensinogen. And this, um, as I'll talk about this afternoon, was in 1988 um, at this meeting when I first presented it. And, you know, that was before 
the epidemic of obesity. It was before fat cells were thought to do anything except store and release lipid. Yes. And so it was kind of like one of the early, what we now know as adipokines, uh, coming out of these cells that can have um, a myriad effects. And so it was really kind of like, people thought I was crazy probably. But that's one question I have for you is how do you, how did you have the persistence to, in the face of doubters, of ideas, I, I know I face that in the world of serotonin, to say, you know, I, I am solid in this finding. This does mean something. What did you have to do to, to just not listen? I think, I think it's just having, um, and I know you have this, some sort of ability to look at a finding and say, oh, wow. Well. <laughs> and uh, isn't that this cool? This is something different, <laughs> yeah. and I have to pursue this, yes. and I have to make sure it's real. And so, um, you know, we went all the way from, from a rat adipocytes into to human cells and to, to show that they all, uh, fat cells all made angiotensinogen. But, yeah, it was just something that um, recognizing it is a very novel finding and saying, uh, you know, first off, rigor to make sure it's real. Yes. And then, and then just trying to pursue it towards very basic logical questions. Why would fat cells make the precursor to angiotensin II? Absolutely. Well, and that discovery you've alluded to was is certainly connected with the second one that has benefited my career, and that's the fact that perivascular adipose tissue, that stuff you remove from around the vessel, is something we can't ignore in terms of modifying vascular function. And you published with Ed Sultis in 1991. Yes. The first paper that described that perivascular adipose tissue literally had a different function. Mm -hmm. Did you have any idea what that would give birth to? No. Do you know how many times that paper has been cited? It's yeah, a ton. It's, I, I, well, and I can't thank you and all of your all's work to take this field so much further uh, listening in the meeting than I ever could have dreamed of, so thank you. You know, it was just, again, very simple uh, thinking if, if, this, if this fat surround, surrounding the aorta could make angiotensinogen, what was it doing to the aorta, and had, it, had anybody studied that? Yeah. Yes, Ed Soltis, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, trained with David Bohr and in Clinton, the de same department as Clinton Webb, one of my nominators. Um, I talked him into doing these really weird organ bath experiments <laughs> and aortic rings with and without fat. Let's see, that's gorgeous. Uh, just simple, uh, doing some very basic things. Had a really hard time publishing that paper. Sent it to five journals before it got accepted. There, and you are that. right, it is highly cited. Uh, and people like you and others are really helping us to understand how important this peri-organ really fat is. Well, you gave birth to a new field of vascular biology, and Ed Soltis wrote me saying how sorry he was that he couldn't be here, that he's going to be thinking of you while he oh, did this, so nice. and, it, it, and it was so heartfelt. So those are just two of the different fields that Dr. Lisa Cassis has given birth to, but the other really is involving aneurysms. Yeah. And as, you're, as so you went down from the thoracic aorta yeah. down into the yeah. abdomen, how did that come to be? Another accident. <laughs> Serendipity is good. <laughs> Another accident. We were trying to study hypertension of, the, of this meeting and atherosclerosis and why when they're together the atherosclerosis is so much worse. Uh, so my colleague Alan Doherty, who is also here, and I'm thrilled that he's here, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, he studied atherosclerosis in mouse models and I studied angiotensin in hypertension. So we simply tried to superimpose hypertension on his mouse models. Um, by infusing angiotensin. But it was, um, I have to say, if, if I can for a minute, that this was in 1998, and in 1998, not that many people were using mice as a model of angiotensin hypertension. Oh, that, it, and boy, has that changed. Yes. <laughs> and so we, we really had a lot of basic things to figure out um, because we had to expose the mice chronically to angiotensin because atherosclerosis is so slowly developing. Okay. So we finally uh, settled on osmotic mini pumps. There were no tail cuff systems. There was no telemetry. 
we were using, I'll talk about this, a, pol a polygraph and a jerry-rigged tail cuff in mice one at a time. <laughs> and, you know, a mouse's heartbeat uh, of 500 beats per minute. Uh, that ink blot was all over me, <laughs> uh, all over my lab coat. It was something else. Um, but again, it was an accident. Uh, we were trying to clean the aortas to quantify atherosclerosis, and we saw these very large structures uh, typically in the suprarenal part of the uh, abdominal aorta okay and uh, we called them an aneurysm and for the past 25 years yes I have been studying that well and that and one of the most interesting you find things you're finding are sex differences yes. in aneurysms that has incredible importance as we in the cardiovascular field understand almost for whatever disease, but certainly for hypertension and aneurysms, that you may end up at the same place, but how you get there yeah. might be the mechanism how you get there, or maybe the severity of the disease. How did you come apart upon sex differences in aneurysms? It was uh, something that we started noticing early on in these studies. It's interesting because people in the atherosclerosis world typically used female mice, which is very different from uh -huh. hypertension. Yeah, they did really that different. because female mice did not fight as much when they were in, in cages together, and so that, less ink clipping around. Yeah, so <laughs> and, and that you know could have aggravated the atherosclerosis and created an artifact in the males. So they typically did females, but one time a company gave us male mice because these mice were very expensive, and so we started noticing that oh my, all of a sudden we were getting really robust and very severe aneurysms. So then we did side-by-side -side comparisons of males and females, beautiful. reproduced um, the sex difference in aneurysms or aortopathies, as I call them, almost to the exact same level in the human disease. And then, of course, uh, set about to try to understand the mechanisms of, of that sex difference, which is one of the most fun things I've ever done in my scientific career. Well, and that, that's one of the wonderful things about you, Lisa, when I've heard you talk. It is so clear that the joy in science that you have, it comes across. And you speak so honestly about what you did, just like you have here, just saying, we saw something, did not know what it meant, but knew it was solid yeah. and decided to pursue it. So what are you working on right now that you're well, keenly interested I'm, in? I'm working on something near and dear to your heart, and yes. that is serotonin. It and is. The serotonin 3 receptor. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a new... Uh, NIH uh, R01 on this topic. Congratulations. Thank Hard you. Fought. Thank you. Well, yeah. you helped me along the way here. I'm glad I basically have found that if I block the serotonin 3 receptor in our ANCH2 model of uh, aortopathies, I can almost totally obliterate the aneurysm formation. So I went back to my roots wow. of periaortic fat, which you is did. why I was listening so much to your people's talks here, yeah. um, because I've been looking at the hypothesis that the serotonin is coming from that fat that surrounds the aorta and influencing the development of aneurysms. And, well, and this is a place we can absolutely collaborate. How does your family feel about you as a scientist? They're here for your lecture yes. tonight. And I've mentioned only a few of the really the different fields that you've given birth to, but they've watched this happen. So, and, yeah. Are your are your kids scientists? Do they do they watch what you do? Not, neither one of my children are scientists, yeah. but my husband is, oh. uh, and and we met doing science, and so. Oh, cool. um, uh, but yeah, they are they're here. Uh, I'm so thrilled they're here. It means the world to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, as many of our children do, I don't know how much they understand about what I really do. So today they're going to hear. They uh, are. For the, probably the first time. I think time. you're going to wow them. Uh, and they're going to go, so, oh, so that's what mom does. That's why she was so busy all the time. <laughs> uh, but they've just been an incredibly supportive family, and they uh, mean the world to me. And, you know, I think we all do uh, research because it, it, it has something to do with us and our family. So my father had a uh, very bad heart disease. He had his first heart attack at 51. Oh and it was research like people in the American Heart Association supported research that kept him alive for 30 years. So to me, it's like I, I started down this path because it had something to do with my family. And I think that's kind of the way I've approached everything and I'm sure you're probably very similar. Yeah, I, I, you, I'm a nerd. I love science and I absolutely, but one of the things that has been so important to me 
are our people. Well, I guess one can call them mentors along the way. When the fear of not succeeding, the fear of not knowing if that finding was a good thing was there, and they would talk me off the cliff. Yeah. Right? Have you had people like that in your life? Oh, I still have mentors. Yes, uh, you never. You? I, yes, I, I, absolutely. I always have mentors. I, I've had in, incredible mentors uh, during my training. Um, Mike Peach, who introduced me to the Rain and Angiotensin system, mm -hmm. and the University of Virginia, people like Bob Carey, Ariel Gomez, Kevin Lynch, Gary Owens, all gave me uh, the foundations of understanding the Rain and Angiotensin system, um, encouraged me when I made that weird finding of angiotensinogen <laughs> in Don't adipose, do this. Don't throw it away. Uh, collaborated with me on it over the years, on and off. And um, really kind of, you're right, they, they, they reinforce that what you're doing, you should persevere. It may be out of the box. It may not be, uh, it may be hard for people to accept some of these findings sometimes, but persistence is key. Yeah, I, I know for different things in my life, when you feel it here and you say, I know this is something that's solid and this is something we can't ignore, having, yeah, that pit bull mentality of saying, I'm not going to let this go. I'm going to be able to do it. That has clearly been incredibly successful well, for you. Well, you are so. good at that. <laughs> well, my nickname is Pitbull. So, <laughs> so, so many people uh, wanted to be able to write you letters for this. Uh, they, they, Bob Carey, who, who as you know is not well at this time, wrote that principal letter for you. And it was one of the most gorgeous things I've read. It was heartfelt, yeah. right? Suzanne Oprah, Ken Bernstein, Clinton Webb, and people. There were so many Angie Chenson people, too, who couldn't, because of their, their conflict of interest on this committee, but it, I was told it was such an easy thing to be able to give you the excellence in hypertension oh, research means, award. That means the world to me. Yeah. I, I admire and respect all of you, all of those people, so much. Just the thought that they would write me a letter, much less think that my research was, it was significant uh, uh, is really, you know, just a wonderful thing to have in your career, it right? Is, it is. Yeah. Before we close, is there anything that you'd like to be able to tell trainees who are looking at and saying, well, I can't ever be there? Well, the first thing I would tell them is to, is to pay it forward. I think you and I both have that attitude and that approach. You pay it forward, and that means um, you train the next generation. You 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 give and work to for the American heart and the and the places that support our research because that's really important. I mean, we can't just be people that are supported by these agencies. We have to be people that are helping push that there is funding for research. Right? Yes. Uh, and that all of us can keep going forward. So I would tell trainees, it's more than just your individual grant. It's more than just your simple little question or hypothesis. It's the community of science and the people that um, will be here long after you uh, that are your legacy in this, this world of research, which is so important because, uh, like I started with my father, uh, if we don't have people doing this type of research, and I saw a lot of these discoveries here, we won't have that next thing for diseases like I've heard preeclampsia, no drug treatments, yes. aneurysms, no drug treatments, heart this failure. kind of thing. We have a lot of heart failure, you know, half path kind of heart failure. We have a lot of work to do, and uh, I, I'm so appreciative to the American Heart Association for helping us all do it. Well, and I, I'm going to agree with you on this. This has been, as many young people who, who are watching this may have heard, that this is our scientific home. This is my scientific home, and this yeah. is a place where so much happens. You find your community. You're inspired by the science that you have. But it takes work to keep us together as that community. So I agree with you 100% yeah. that you can't just come and do your science, but that you need to engage in making this community. We find these things together. Yeah, right. we find yeah. these things. Learn from each other. I learn as much from my trainees as they learn from me. Isn't that the truth? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm good. Yeah. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. This and I can't thank you enough. Yeah, I'm gonna give you a hug. I think it's. Yeah. Yeah, so.
Congratulations to you, Dr. Lisa Cassisa, the you. University of Kentucky, for this award. And I can't wait to hear your lecture oh, today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.